So uh, I'll try and keep the time here because I don't want to make us late for our excursion. But like everyone, I'm going to thank the organizers for inviting me. Some of you may not know this, but I lived in Moscow in the Brezhnev era when I was four years old. So for me, it's really to come back and come with the metro, but not much else. And Moscow is a fun place when you're four. It's really quite good. Okay. I'm going to talk about my vortices, and I know I tend to speak rather quickly, so I will not talk, I will not discuss all the words I've put on the transparency. You can pick and choose between what I say and the words. And if I find I'm running out of time, I will just cut out part of what I'm saying. So I'm normally at UCSD, which is in San Diego, but I'm spending a year in Toulouse, which is a very nice place, highly recommended. And this is a chance to talk about work I've been doing for a couple of years, supported by the National Science Foundation. So I'm going to talk about the physical side of things, not so much the, the application to biology. And from a sort of fluid perspective, vorticity is a very interesting quantity because we know exactly when it was first written down by Helmholtz, although of course we already knew about it. And I won't discuss the history of science question as to why people cared about vorticity in the 19th century, trying to describe the universe. But from our perspective, you can say that it's a very good source of difficult problems to understand fundamental fluid behavior. And because it's difficult, we make approximations. And so maybe one of the things about this meeting is trying to think about good approximations or good models. And the three approximations that people talk about, rather wordy, are to talk about two-dimensional flows. And for someone like me who's interested in the ocean and atmosphere, that's quite good, because I have strong forces, strong constraints to give themselves two-dimensional motion. So I will stay with this. This is a two-dimensional talk, except right at the end. We also talk about singular vorticity distributions. I want to change a difficult PDE, the Euler equation, or the vorticity equation, into ODEs. I'm trying to reduce the model. And point vortices are natural, and I'm going to work with point vortices, but one of the things that I'm going to try and argue is that in many cases we need to think about the underlying dynamics which were kind of abstracted away in the point vortex. And finally, a classical point vortex is an object in potential flow, pre rotational in this fluid. And I'd like to think about other physical effects. So when I talk about generalization, I'm talking about more physics, not so much more geometry or objects and things like that. Okay? I need to show some pictures because it's a pretty subject. This is where it'll come from. This is an aircraft landing in a NASA experiment. We have a nice wingtip vortex. These are soap film experiments. You see interference fringes, and complicated roll-up of vortices here. Just picture one is a photograph. Yes, that's a photograph. Taken from behind the plane. It's a smoke, red smoke. Oh, they put the smoke out there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Purpose. It's on purpose. <laughs> this is an experiment in the stratified fluid in Canada with false color. You can see a dipole and a wake. I'm not trying to talk about the details of the experiments. This is just for motivation. This is where I normally live, up here. This is Mexico. San Diego is here. And this is a wake behind an island. And this may remind you of something that Scott showed, because it is simulations by Jeff Eldridge's group. And here we start to talk more about the interface with biology. This is a simulation of a flapping 2D ellipse, with the idea of understanding insects light, and so we see the creation of vorticity and the shedding of it, and this is a fairly complicated calculation. What about simpler models, two-dimensional point vorticities, how do we do them? Okay, so here we're going to talk about, and these I may chop or change as we progress, I'll talk about what you might call classical point vortices, talk a bit about the history and momentum, and then how one might generalize, and then I'll discuss two main generalizations here, there are others which I'll just discuss in passing. One is the effect of compressibility, and I'm particularly interested in that, and the other is a thing called SQG, surface quasi geostrophy I'm not explaining why I care about that. The point vortices are still two-dimensional, but I care about the third dimension, and then I'll conclude. Please ask questions. Um, if we slow down, we just slow down. Okay, so history, point vortices. They go back to um, Helmholtz and Kirchhoff. There are many applications which I've listed. I won't go through them. Essentially, what a point vortex does is it moves with the fluid, but if I think about potential flow, I have to take off the 
part of the complex velocity that has a singularity. Because otherwise my limit would be very strange. I'd be saying what happens to the velocity when the velocity locally is infinite has a singularity. Now physically say that doesn't matter, it goes around, but it's still strange mathematically. So I take this limit, I remove it. Why is that a good idea? We'll do it. Why do we do it? Is it obvious? And I, I thought about that, and I'll just tell you briefly some of the motivations, some of the explanations, because they're relevant later. For those of you who are interested in vortex dynamics, there's an excellent bibliography by Mileshko and Arif, and I'd just like to say they both died last year, which is very tragic, within a few weeks of each other. So Helmholtz gave a verbal argument. He was talking about two both vortex filaments, saying they move around each other. And that's been used, if you look at many, many books, Lamb, Rush books, I could read the ones that might translate into English, and maybe American, French, English books, they say that. One vortex sits on its own, so to put more vortices, I just ignore the self-interactions. There are two other ideas that are very interesting that we use to discuss hot vortex motion. One is what I call an MAE, a matched asymptotic expansion approach, which was first written down by, essentially, verbally, J.J. Thompson, who then discovered the electron later. His argument is that if I have an array of vortices with some internal structure, if the vortices are far enough away, locally, they will be deformed by the strain field of the entire fluid, but the deformations are neutral modes. They do not grow. So from a large distance, I don't see them, and the vortices behave locally like point vortices. This argument was formalized later by Ting, and I'll come back to There's also an argument based on momentum conservation, which was given first by Friedrichs, and was very active in the 1950s, well, as a problem of dates, but it was important to understand things called the bright michael equation, which I will not discuss. And this argument is resumed, it's given again in the sample. So that's essentially how people justify vortex dynamics. And one thing I thought when I was in Swan Moscow on Monday, as I went to the Moscow Historical Museum, and there was a display with a picture of Zhukovsky and one of his notebooks, which is rather nice. Zhukovsky worked on point vortices, but I won't tell you what he said. Okay, mathematically we can generalize by saying if I have a point vortex that is a 1 over z singularity in the velocity, what about higher singularities? This is just a list of people who worked on that, you'll recognize some names. The original paper is 1928 in Russia. I'd like to thank people for sending me that paper because I could not find it in the West. They use the same approaches, these pro proposals to derive the equation of motion. We can remove the singularities. That would include energy renormalization, throw away the infinite bits. Physicists are very comfortable with this, but I find it not obvious why this should be correct. Conserve momentum, match asymptotics, weak functions. And I recently came across a reference by Flusher and Gustafsson, which is relevant to these ideas. The problem with this approach is it doesn't work for dipole, which is very frustrating. But I'm going to talk about it a lot, because I'm going to talk about point vortex generalizations. It does work for dipole, because if I put two point vortices, and I try and set that the limit, I'm sorry, I put two vortices which are in the limit become a dipole, then try and move infinitely fast, so that's very frustrating. Okay, let me tell you a bit about conservation momentum, and then get on to these physical generalizations, which will all be generalizations of point vortices. So this is the argument that Southman used, which I want to discuss briefly, it's very interesting. I take the conservation law for momentum, Newton's second law, and write it for a moving contour, have direct change of momentum inside my contour, a pressure force and a flux of momentum through the boundary, because my boundary is not necessarily a material surface. If you do this in complex notation and shrink the contour, you get a very simple result. That the rate of change of what you might call the complex momentum is equal to this quantity. And for a point vortex, if you work this out locally, you can get something which is very small as my contour shrinks. Therefore, this is zero, and therefore, the velocity of the point vortex is that limit I gave you before. I take the full velocity field and subtract the singularity. So what is going on is that physically, outside my point vortex, I satisfy conservation momentum, Newton's second law, and on any contour around the vortex, as small as it may be, I satisfy an integrated version of Newton's second law. It's not clear you can do much better than this. I'm pretty happy I have 
two components of momentum, I get two equations. Gamma is conserved for physical reasons. You also conserve angular momentum, so that's very nice. But if you think about it, there are an infinite of hierarchy of quantities that are not conserved. But they're not momentum, so we don't think about them physically. You can do this with dipoles, you have to work a bit harder. You have to subtract off the basic state and multiply by some weight functions. But it works, and you get the same equation for the velocity, and you get the equation for the rate of change of the dipole strength. As the dipole moves, it reorients its dipole moment. And these are the same equations as in Janowski's work. For high singularities, this fails. Well, this approach has arbitrary regularization. Janowski's paper, Tor Janowski, they argue that means there are no high singularities. You could argue that instead, the high singularities have problems. You can try them and see if they're useful. Okay. So that essentially is talking about point vortices and potential flow and generalizations of them. What about other physics? So potential flows, rather crude approximation to a fluid, it has no viscosity, it has no flexibility. What more can we do? Okay. So again, this is wordy, but let me briefly say what I want to do. I want to try more physics, and I'd like to start from the fundamental equation of the conservation laws. And so that, to me, really suggests thinking about this mashed asymptotic approach. If I have more physics, there may be regions in the fluid where different balances hold. Different physics, different components of the forces or of the balances are important. So compressibility is going to be what I look at mostly. And there we have a very interesting issue with the near and far fields. Then I'll look at this 2D vortex dynamics for 3D transport. I will not discuss vortices with mass. They don't really fall into this approach because they don't come from a perturbation of a point vortex. I won't discuss hybrid singularities. I won't discuss the presence of bodies in my system or of non-plane geometries. These are all other things one can do. I want to talk about different equations, not different boundary conditions. Okay. So the first thing I'll talk about is a few topics where I'm just going to resume other people's work, but I'm not working on them myself. The first is viscosity. So viscosity is interesting because it's a problem for anything like a point vortex or a singular structure. Because diffusion will kick in and smooth out my vorticity field. Okay, so vortex sheet will be smoothed out and so on and so forth. However, viscosity is very nice because in many situations I replace a continuous spectrum by a discrete spectrum, which makes life simpler. Well, sort of. And that's particularly apparent in stability theory. So physically, you could say the following. I know that my viscous problem will diffuse, but if my Reynolds number is high enough, then if I think about time scales, there might be a time scale over which I haven't had enough time to diffuse my vorticity, so it's really smeared things out. So it still looks like a point vortex, and it's a long enough time that my system can evolve and do something interesting. Okay, in fact, there's some work by Nagam and colleagues who looked at this and they worked in terms of moment expansions. They took the full 2D viscous equation and worked out the evolution of the moments of that equation with appropriate Hermit functions and they could obtain a system that included both viscosity and finite size effects. You have to have finite size because as soon as your system switches on, the vorticity diffuses a bit. And they looked at a couple of things. But there really hasn't been much work on this since then. I discussed this yesterday with Joe, which is a an interesting question about what happens in other geometries. Yes, come a question. Um, uh, just, just a question. Um, when you say the vorticity diffuses out, you mean magnitude? Well, I mean that if I put down a delta function of vorticity in a viscous fluid, essentially, if I don't worry about the motion too much, the heat equation is just diffusing vorticity into the fluid. So I no longer have just a delta function, I have a gas in that okay. area. Thank you. One thing that's not at all clear in this system is what is the large Reynolds number limit. These limits are often very difficult, although to be fair, Nagam et al. do prove some results, which is rather useful. Also, the long time validity is not obvious. I imagine, although no one's done this, that if I integrate these equations for a long time, eventually your 
assumptions, scale separation will break down and something will go wrong. So that would be an interesting question how that happens. So that's a set equation that exists that hasn't really been looked at. This is an example of their result. They look at what happens about a co-rotating pair with viscosity, and they show you the difference between the frequency, I'm sorry, how the frequency and time evolve. The frequency changes because viscous effects smear out the vortices and they no longer go around at a constant speed. Okay. Two other approaches that I'm interested in but I haven't been working on. They're the first one is very conceptually relevant. It's a paper by Gorshkov et al. 2000. Once again, not much follow-up, although I think it's very interesting. What they look at is the following idea. They say, I have some strong vortices. Let's say they're something like a Rankine vortex, so a vortex patch. And I have some perturbation to my physics. I have stratification or something like that. How does the system evolve? The idea being that if the vortices are strong enough, I have some weak perturbation, I can solve it in expansion. And when you do that, they obtain evolution equations by talking about orthogonality conditions on the spectrum. So your ranking vortex supports waves, supports a spectrum. You want to deal with those to enforce secularity conditions. So we're coming right back to more classical Russian work, ideas of averaging and secularity. And they look at some examples, but I'd say that there hasn't been much on this since then, and I'm particularly interested in this in the context of dipoles moving in stratification. You could use this approach to predict the correction to the flow, the velocity of the dipole moving down. Now the question is what happens if you take a different structure to the vortices? The ranking vortex has a discrete spectrum. What if I take a Gaussian vortex, which does not have a discrete spectrum? So again, I think there's some very interesting problems to be done here. And the physics can be written down quite simply. Something very briefly, there's a very interesting paper by Kozlov and related work by Zavala, Sanson, and Van Heist, who look at a thin layer of fluid at the bottom of the layer. One obtains an equation that is like 2D vorticity, but which has extra terms which in particular are nonlinear. And it's shown in the paper that initial vorticity patches can become point vortices. But I haven't seen much discussion more recently of how those point vortices might evolve. There's an issue here because the Ekman layer tries to spin down the fluid, so it kills the vorticity. Nevertheless, you appear to get point vortices, and I don't understand that yet. Something I haven't really followed up. Okay, let me talk about the thing I'm most interested in, which is compressible point vortices. There is a motivation here. If I have an aircraft flying along, a large transport aircraft today, the Mach number is quite large. People care a lot about the fate of the trailing vortices behind the aircraft in terms of scheduling airports and landings. You don't want to flip over your light plane behind your Airbus 380. So understanding stability of these vortices is interesting, and again, reduced models are relevant. And mathematically, you can say the Euler equation is just a special case incompressible limit of more general compressible equation. Can we take a reduced model? Now, point vortices have a problem because if I have a point vortex and flow around like 1 over r, there's a region where the flow becomes supersonic in the core. So the physics then must change. I'll return to that. So there has been work on this. There's a paper by Varsomi Nagy et al. who look at a steady problem with vortices and they have to consider the internal structure of the vortices. And there are papers by Pullman Moore and Leppington who look at a steadily propagating compressible vortex pair and compute the velocity. In all these cases, one of the tools they use is what's called the Rayleigh-Janssen expansion, where I have an expansion in Mach number of essentially my fluid properties, velocity and potential. So the question I have is what is the unsteady version of this? Can I get unsteady compressible point vortices? What they look like? So I'm going to give you a sketch of how you do this, not all the details because it's messy. So we have in fact three regions. We expect to have a region where the point vortices interact, but you can't see their core structure. I expect to have a very large scale region where something's going on in the middle, and I get waves coming out. I expect to have a local core region where I can see the structure of the vortices. 
So in the bulk, where things are moving around like point vortices, this is my governing equation. I've written it in terms of the velocity potential, which is no longer a harmonic function. As you can find in the blocking set. There's the equation, this is the Mach number, a ratio of specific hits, and so it's a rather complicated nonlinear equation. But as an expansion in the Mach number, the leading order solution is incompressible harmonic function. And so what I want to look at is a set of point vortices. So the potential for a point vortex is logarithmic and has capital N point vortices. One thing that's not entirely obvious is if I have an expansion in Mach number, should I be expanding the position of the vortex? Will that change different orders? And that's very relevant in a related geophysical problem I'll mention. Okay, the standard argument says that the velocity of the point vortex with the bar is the velocity here subtracting off the nasty bit. So that's the sum of all the other velocities that should be a v to p, and then the prime to take away the single angle. Okay, so what happens with compressibility? So you have to expand the equations, and what you find is that the correction term satisfies this equation, which is kind of messy, and you can use the initial complex potential to obtain this. This is a complex conjugate. I have complex conjugates here, time derivatives, z derivatives, and you can obtain a particular solution by just integrating up once comes out straight away. You can actually do this integral. I made some minor changes. Trust me, well, this comes out without too much trouble. And so I have that the complex velocity, so I'm cheating here, I should really use the complex potential, then add complex conjugates, and I'm just using shortcuts, but this, this is formally correct. I have this particular integral, because there's a choice, the right hand side, and this is a complementary function. I have terms like 1 over z and terms like 1 over z squared. This is a point vortex like term, and this is a dipole like term. And my solution here is not harmonic, it's got bars in it because my correction term does not satisfy the Plasser's equation. So I found that. So it turns out that. If you do this with a steady case, as was done by Pullen and Moore and by Leffington, you really want to correct the position of the vortex. For example, if I expand this vortex over here, which is like that, I get a solution for my point vortices, which is like e to the minus i theta over r, so that's just going around like that. Plus a little bit. If I expand the W1P term, I get a whole bunch of really nasty things including a 1 over r squared term. And we don't like this term. It's very frustrating because it says there's a dipole flow through the vortex. I don't want that physically. And it's because I've got the wrong position of the vortex. And so you can adjust the vortex position as in Work with well, new variables and do a lot of algebra. And you can fix that term. So when you do that, you actually find the potential velocity, and you'll find that the velocity has a term in it which is constant at the vortex. So you're saying, look, I have this vortex here. The vortex moves the fluid to order one, but when I compute the next correction term, which is this plus another bit, I find something goes through it. So what you do then is you just say, therefore, the correction term the question, yes. Adjusting the vortex position. It's because why, why, why just do that, right? You have to do that because otherwise you find a term in your expansion at the next order which is too singular. And it's because I haven't given myself the freedom to adjust the potential. Yes, or the velocity either. The term is too singular, uh -huh. but it's an artifact of an incorrect choice of your vortex position. Uh -huh. So if I'd been more careful, I'd have started by expanding everything and then said, look, it doesn't work. Uh -huh. You can also do it by changing your potential, but this physically is quite intuitive because you can see, and you can't see why it has to move exactly that amount, but it's because you've, opt, you've got the wrong position of the vortex. So it's a poor choice of coordinate system. Okay. That's what it is. So you can fix that. 
And then what you find is that your velocity of your vortex, there's a terminus is constant. So I've got rid of the dipole singularity, but now there's a flow through the vortex. So we don't like that. And we then get the equation very simply, the same argument, that the position of the vortex is exactly moving with the fluid. Now, this is a bit suspicious, because I spent a little time telling you it's not immediately obvious why that is correct in the compressible case. In the compressible case, why should it be correct? Um, I think it is correct. And I think, in fact, the whole success of the matching process relies on the fact that when I compute the inner field solution, it has to give this result. Otherwise, I would have to modify my inner field to change the physics. So I believe this is correct, but I haven't done a formal calculation. The thing that is not obvious is the following. In my complementary function, I haven't shown you, but I had to work and work out these two terms. This term I, I haven't shown you, but you fix it. There's also a term corresponding to a circulatory condition at order n squared. It is not obvious that that should be zero or what it should be. Previous work has always said, I specify the circulation and it stays the same. There's no correct in the higher orders. But maybe that's incorrect. Maybe we should be fixing the vorticity divided by the density, expanding that and making that the same. So again, I think there's a choice of systems. You can make different physical choices. So I've got the equations, but since I finished getting them out this morning, I have written them down for you. And there are some things to do. The first thing one should be able to do is recover the Leppington results, the steadily propagating dipole, in this framework. So I now have a dipole that moves. I should get the same result. The second question is now to go and do two vortices, three vortices, and find out whether the compressibility leads to interesting dynamics. OK. So now, the other point is I have these other regions of physics, this far field, right, so that's the local behavior in this inner field. So the far field has been looked at because if you look at what's called aeroacoustic theory of sound, the generation of sound by jet engines, things like that, this is the problem. I have a complicated flow with vorticity, and I find a long way away sound waves. And so in fact, there's a paper by Crow that does this. It does a formal matching procedure between an inner vortical region and an outer wave region. So I don't want to do that because it's messy. One of the questions is the following. I will get waves in the far field. Can these waves take energy away and change my internal dynamics? And Crow doesn't do that problem. However, it is done by Ford et al. in 2000. And their motivation is in geophysics. They consider a rotating shallow water system, which looks like a 2D compressible fluid. And they compute the expansion. And they find that the inner region, the dynamics are modified at this order m to the fourth, m to the fourth log n. So if I was feeling very ambitious, I could take my approach, I could go to fourth order, and then show that I had a system where the dynamics were modified by energy going to the far field. That would probably be a bit too massive. Then there's the core structure. So as I said, if I just go into a pond vortex, it doesn't work because it blows up, because I want to run. So how do you deal with that? And Barsoni Nagyatal discussed this problem, and they used a matching procedure, where I had an incompressible flow that looked like a quantum vortex inside. And locally, I had some kind of compressible solution. And what you find is you find that you have a potential that looks like it satisfies this equation. And this equation was first written down by G.I. Taylor in 1930. And you can solve this equation and you can match it to the point vortex. However, it's not obvious, but when you go in and see what they did, they make a very strong choice about what they do. They essentially say they have a region of vacuum, that so they evacuate the point vortex, and just have a region of vacuum that supports circulation. It's not obvious this is the best thing to do. Maybe one should think about a rotational core 
with the appropriate compressible analog of this. But they don't do that. In particular, this thing here has to be rotated. So it would be interesting to investigate other interior models. Maybe the physics isn't unique. This solution is sometimes called a hollow vortex, and that's rather interesting. I won't talk about it. So how long do I have? Another five minutes? Very briefly, my last topic, this is about what are called set surface quasi-trophic point vortices. And the idea here is that the theory of dynamical systems has been used a lot to understand 2D oceanic motion. But the ocean is not really two-dimensional. This is a simulation of the upper surface of the ocean with a very large computer. This is an actual calculation using invariant manifolds of flow in the Gulf of Mexico. But the question is what happens in three dimensions? And so in three dimensions, these ideas are not so well understood, but it'd be nice to have some kind of system where I could have a simplified ODE structure to understand the flow. And there's a vacuum system called surface quasi-geostrophy, where I look at the evolution of temperature on a boundary, and I can find the flow in the interior. On the boundary, I have a conservation law with a velocity like this. That's 2D advection. And what you find is that you can relate the string function to the boundary condition with an elliptic problem. Very simple. If you do that, you find point vortices. The string function looks like this, 1 over 2 pi mod x. And you can obtain the equations of motion of the vortices which look just like the normal ones with the three here. What you also find is inside the fluid, there is motion that is horizontal to leading order. That's this. And there's a correction to the velocity that is vertical. Essentially, the buoyancy is affected. You get a weak vertical velocity. So you can then compute three-dimensional particle trajectories. See what they look like. That's what that's supposed to say. They look like this. You can get these vertical velocities below the point vortices. <laughs> and so then the question is, I have a system with 2D dynamics and 3D transfer of particles. What are the Lagrangian properties of that system? The complication is that what I've done so far is inconsistent. I have an order one horizontal velocity field and a small vertical velocity field. I should include the correction to the horizontal velocity field. And that correction is rather difficult to calculate. People haven't really done it very much. So that's one of the goals. And then the idea is how you can obtain, or what you can say about this 3D Lagrangian coherent structure ideas from this 2D vortex evolution system. OK, so to conclude, as I said, I spoke about classical point vortices. <coughs> we have a good history of where the results come from. I spoke about compressible point vortices. I can calculate the order x squared correction. Some issues about what is a vortex, what is fixed, potential or normal vorticity. And then I spoke a bit about the garage of human structures. There's a nice model of soap films that looks like compressible 2D flow with gamma equals 1, which is possible for normal gas. So that's an interesting question. General considerations. You can try and think about this in other geometries, spheres, and manifolds with boundaries. So that's nothing to do. And I think there are two mathematical themes I'll discuss. The first one is that in this approach, where I'm computing corrections to the point vortices, how good do these do? How good are these for long time? If I go up to times order one over my small parameter, does everything break down? Is it uniformly valid? And the second theme is that we have these regions with different physics, and it's important to understand those to get the motion of the point vortices. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Questions or comments? <coughs> Have you ever heard about multiple particles? Uh, I've heard, okay, so I've heard about vortons. There was some work in the 1980s and 90s about solutions of 3D potential flow with singularities. Um, from what I've read, I wasn't entirely convinced what they could do for you. I've read a couple of papers about them, but I'm not an expert on them, I have to say. There are papers also by Sapman and people in the 80s.
Well, I haven't read them very recently. Um, I think in the context of geophysical flows, where you have this strong stratification, I think they're probably more useful. I think one of the problems is that, as I remember it, the equations of motion had real problems with the stretching terms, and I've forgotten exactly how that was addressed. In 3D quasi geometry, that doesn't happen so much. Um, so I'm aware of the papers, but I haven't looked at them recently. Having uh, could you name any literature or uh, where we can where we can see or are there any physical experiments where we can uh, have some quantitative results? Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, I think the soap in the soap films you can do experiments, but no one has tried to do a soap film experiment with pond water seeds. So they look like most of them are a sheet that falls down. I have recently seen experiments, certain experiments, which are on a hemispherical bubble. So you have a bubble which is a hemisphere, mm -hmm. um, and they actually, in their case, they were interested in temperature difference of driving the flow. Excuse me. Thank you again.